Uh, good morning, everyone. We'll, we'll begin. Uh, welcome to, uh, to everyone in the room and everyone who is watching via the webcast. My name is Rob Wells, and I'm the interim director of the Center for Teaching for Innovation in Teaching and Learning. On behalf of myself and Sonia Knudsen, uh, who's the director of the Internationalization Office, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce John Rubin, former director of the uh, SUNY COIL Center and the principal of COIL Consulting. John will be visiting Memorial for the next two days to introduce the, the, the COIL, or Collaborative Online International Learning Concept, to Memorial. And Sonia and I have been monitoring COIL uh, developments for quite some time. And we're convinced that it represents an opportunity to provide a meaningful virtual international experience for our learners. John will be conducting a workshop this afternoon that will take a deeper dive into the subject. If your interest is piqued by what you learned this morning, please contact Sonia or myself to register for the workshop. If you aren't able to attend this afternoon, John has some time available uh, tomorrow morning to meet with you to discuss the concept further either in person or virtually, uh, please contact Gladys White at 864-7921 or gwhite at mun.ca to arrange a time. Now, we are webcasting this, and uh, John will be speaking, of, uh, making a presentation for a while. Then we'll take Q&A afterwards. If you're watching virtually, uh, then please use the, uh, the Twitter handle, hashtag coilnl, all uh, uppercase. Uh, and uh, questions will be relayed to John uh, at that time. So, thank you very much for your particip participation today. I've heard John speak on this subject a number of times now, and I'm confident that you will leave today motivated to explore a coil further with an aim to implement it in your courses. Uh, John, welcome to Memorial and Newfoundland. We're delighted to you have joined us. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Glad to see you all here. It's a very <coughs> pleasant room. I was expecting something more like an auditorium. And uh, this is nice with everybody just sitting at tables. I just apologize for sort of bringing a chill with me. Uh, it seemed like it was warmer here, and certainly it was warmer where I was in Brooklyn, New York, uh, a day ago. And as I got closer and closer to Memorial, it got colder and colder. Um, but I don't really mind. And I even brought my winter coat for the first time this year, so I'm comfortable being here. So um, I also hope, while I'm here, uh, to learn more about Newfoundland and St. John's and Memorial University. Um, a lot of what I'm interested in and what I'll be discussing has to do with mutual or bilateral engagement. Um, that internationalization on any level should be a two-way street. And this COIL model is particularly that. Now, I don't know whether my visit here really is a very good model for it, since I'll be here for about 48 hours. Um, and I'll probably mainly be here on the campus. Um, but uh, I just wanted to start out with that note because I think it's, it's what makes what I'll be talking about somewhat different than at least some other internationalization approaches. And I do hope I'll be back at some point and get to explore uh, the city and the province more fully. So I'm going to read a little bit, I'm going to speak a little bit, I'm going to show some slides, I'm going to show some movies, videos really, uh, and even one animation. So this will be a, a bit of a multimedia approach and uh, hopefully as I switch through different programs I won't stumble too much, but any of you who work with technology know that there are always little glitches. And in fact, teaching a COIL course, which is a course that involves technology, you kind of have to live with that. It's part of teaching with technology. Things occasionally don't work the way you expect. Um, so uh, I'm going to begin, though, with a few broader words. Uh, we live in a world where globalization is affecting us all in many ways, but where too many people are forming their opinions of the world and of others without authentic knowledge. So much of the information we receive is filtered and distorted to the point that fake news has become one of the cliché phrases of the day. 
Our students and our faculty need to transcend that noise to see the world for what it is by having authentic interactions with people living in other cultures and environments. Until recently, the only way to do this was to travel, and probably that modality, when engaged with intensity and self-awareness, is still the best way to learn about the world although it's clear that simply to travel doesn't necessarily open your eyes to other cultures. It depends how you travel, but that's not the topic of my talk today. However, very few university students and fewer instructors than we would like will ever have the chance to blend study and research with travel. In the US, only about 4% of all college students will participate in study abroad or exchange during their college years. In Europe, the numbers are slightly higher, around 10%. In Europe, it's a little easier to travel to another country. You know, some people call it easy, easy jet study abroad. You know, for $25, you can go to a country uh, 1,000 miles away and come back a week later. And it's fairly, there are a lot of countries near each other. I don't mean to speak negatively of that situation, but for those of us in Canada, those of us in the US, to get to another country, except for us, um, takes quite a bit of effort and expense. So in Europe, the numbers are higher, around 10%, but in most of the rest of the world, the figure is 1% or less. In Canada, the overall figure is a little under 3%. So what do we do about the other 95 to 99 percent of students who can't participate or do not in this form of mobility. I believe we must help them to become more cross-culturally sensitive and better global citizens, especially in the politi current political climate. Now, I'm making a couple of references here that may seem rather American, and they kind of are, but I, I would just say that some of these issues that I'm not going to dwell on really uh, are pretty international right now. Um, issues of immigration, issues of uh, globalization, issues of internationalization. There's a lot lurking right now in the political climate all around the world. And so I think it's especially important right now for our students and faculty and staff to be uh, more aware of what's out there and why there's value to people who are different than ourselves. Additionally, those who do travel are often the more privileged. Not always the case, but often it is. And compounding the problem of mobility is a shifting demographic. I'm going to speak here about the US. I don't know if this is identically true here. But the average age of an American college undergraduate is now 24 years old. That's the average age of all undergraduates in the US. There's a, you know, I guess we have a mental image, I still do, of somebody graduating from high school, entering college 17, 18, and that most college students, undergraduates, are of that age. But that group, at least in the US, is now the minority. Most students are older, and some are much older. Many are married and hold down jobs, so they cannot possibly undertake extensive travel abroad. So no wonder we see so many working class and middle class Americans, at least, with such distorted views of the world. They simply have never been there, and they have no direct knowledge of it. I don't think the situation is so different in other places. So collaborative online international learning, or COIL, I think I'll just call it COIL from now on. It's really a mouthful. Um, provides an innovative and authentic pathway for our students and instructors to interact with the world that was not possible in the past. By utilizing rapidly expanding internet connectivity and increasingly widely available and less expensive technology, it has become possible for our instructors, our students, and our classrooms to be connected to international academics and their students far away. However, without guidance and structures, sorry, without guidance and structure, uh, most people utilize the internet only to interact with those like themselves. There's been a lot of research about this. When the internet first sort of exploded, it really seemed to many that this would be a chance for the world to connect and for people to really understand each other much better. But much research confirms the bubble which encloses most of us when we are socially networking online. 
So COIL is an attempt to use the university classroom setting as a vehicle for connecting what we could call diverse cultural and social bubbles for the benefit of all. I'm not sure I should say connecting bubbles. That has a kind of negative sound to it. But uh, I think that is in some case what, would, what does happen, that a group in one area works with a group in another area which would otherwise not know about each other and be isolated within their bubble. The model has been developing organically over the past 20 years, meaning COIL. So this has been around for a while. Um, in the past, it was usually driven by inspired teachers working with colleagues abroad, until recently, usually working without significant university support. So what I want to emphasize, and I'm going to give you an example based on my own experience, is that historically, this work, whether it's called COIL or something else, because that terminology is fairly recent, has been faculty driven, entirely faculty driven, until I would say a couple of activities that took place about 10 years ago, and mainly in the last three years, every single COIL course was an individual professor saying, I want to do this with my colleague in such and such a country, and their dean or chair saying, really? Okay. Um, but in the last few years, fortunately, there's become much more acknowledgement by many folks that this is a viable approach to internationalization. And so now we're getting support, at least in some places, from leadership, from administration, to help this happen. Because it's not easy for an individual professor to just do this on their own. Some do, I did it, but not many people stick their necks out that far to do something that may take a little bit of extra time. So my own, I'm gonna do a little personal serendipity here because I came into this completely as a professor, as a faculty member. I sort of switched over to, as people jokingly say, the dark side um, not that long ago and became more of a administrator in this realm less than 10 years ago, really. So my own interest in online collaborative learning grew out of a cross-cultural video production course that I developed after spending a semester in the country of Belarus on a Fulbright Fellowship way back in 1999, now 18 years ago. Um, I wanted to connect my US students with those I had been working with in Minsk, so I developed a course in which small intercultural teams produce videos on themes which they chose sequentially sending scenes back and forth across the internet while the students reflected on their creative process. So what I mean by this, without getting into the details of the syllabus, is that I would create teams of students, let's say, from New York and Belarus, very small teams, usually two on a side, occasionally one on a side. Those students would communicate with each other and decide a theme for a video they wanted to make together. Then on one side only, they would make the first scene. And that would typically be under four minutes. That would then be posted, and even posting it pre-YouTube, pre-anything more or less, was a challenge. Um, in fact, the first times we were doing it, the university in Minsk and Belarus had such little connectivity that the only way we could send the videos was when the university shut down for the evening, they would click send, and the two or three videos would trickle out all night, and by the next morning, we would have them in New York, um, because it would take many hours to send these short videos. So a different time, but was doable even back then. Um, so this, we began this process. The students would receive the video. They would have two weeks then to reflect on it, meaning write something back, and create the next scene of that video. That would then be posted. Then the first team would get that back and would have two weeks to reflect and produce the next video. Altogether, they would make a sequence of four videos over about nine weeks that weren't trying in a certain level to tell one story. Now, this is an impossible challenge. I mean, it really is. It's a crazy project in a way. But what it does require is that the two groups of students are trying to comprehend each other's point of view. Why did they make this video? What am I supposed to do with it? Even though they did spend some preliminary time supposedly planning it. But most of the time, the videos they received were not what they expected. And most of the time, this caused some consternation. 
So that meant that those students had to find some way to respond. And they had to think, is what I'm sending going to be received well? Do I even understand the people I'm sending it to well enough to know what they would prefer or what they would be interested in? And do I want to give up enough of my ego that I'm going to make something that would be interesting to them rather than to me? These are actually pretty heady questions for a 20-year-old, say, to be dealing with and knowing that they're actually going to be graded on their work because this was a, a four-credit course. This was not extracurricular activity. So, um, and what happened occasionally, I don't want to belabor this much further because I don't want to talk solely about my course. This is a course that took place from 2002 to 2011, so it's already sort of historical. It's actually very unusual in terms of COIL, um, but it's not the only course that took this kind of shape, um, but it's what got me involved into it as a professor. And I would simply say that um, the results were so exciting, were such a revelation to me and to my students generally, that it kind of sent me down a different career pathway. I sort of started to pull back from being a media artist myself and a teacher of film to really f having sort of, I don't know what, drunk the Kool-Aid of my own devices and think this is a really great model, at least, for intercultural exchange. My American students who couldn't find Belarus on the map before the course began, without exception, not one of them could locate it on the map. By the end of the course, we're very, very interested in this little country, landlocked country in Eastern Europe. Um, not an easy target country, let's say, for American students to take interest in. Um, and so it set me down a path that I'll talk a little bit more about, although this is not really a story about me. I'm just trying to put it in a framework that's accessible. So to jump, I'm actually gonna play in just a minute two of these exchange videos, because I think it's interesting to see what came out of this kind of process. Although there'll just be two out of, there are probably three or 400 made over those years. So it's an idiosyncratic pair by itself. But I just wanted to, excuse me, um, just frame a tiny bit more first. And um, in 2006, the State University of New York, where I was based, funded the creation of the SUNY Coil Center and appointed me its first director. However, at that point, I was still a full-time professor and I was just given some release time to be director. So it was a, I was wearing two hats, uh, a bit of conflict um, in terms of time, um, but that's how the center began. Um, and I was in that position until about eight months ago when I retired from SUNY and created a small company, basically me, uh, called COIL Consulting so that I could work with other institutions who wish to develop their own COIL programs. I'm not going to talk very much about that history, but towards the end of the presentation, I am going to give you a, a couple of examples of larger COIL initiatives because I think for this to really hold water, you would want to have hundreds or thousands of your students doing COIL courses, not just doing like one COIL course, which might be where you would start. It really depends on the goals that Memorial might set if it wants to go down this path. Um, so I want to give you at least one rich example of a larger scale COIL initiative. Most of this will be talking about what COIL is. Um, but I would say that there have been hundreds, maybe by now thousands of COIL courses linking many dozens of countries and tens of thousands of student participants have been involved in this medium. So it's gotten beyond the sort of earliest stages. It's sort of in some emergent transition place, I think, within the educational landscape. So what I'm gonna do now, so you can stop listening to me talk for a minute, uh, for actually for about nine minutes, is we're gonna look at two videos um, made by students. So these were made about seven years ago. Uh, the first video I'm gonna show you was made by a, a young woman at SUNY Purchase, which is where I was still teaching. The Purchase is about 30 miles north of New York City. Um, the theme that these two students chose was imagination. So you're first gonna see her video, it's about three minutes long. Then we will switch over and see the response video from her partner in Minsk. We won't go beyond that. This was a four video series, but we're only gonna look at the first two just because we have a lot of other things that we wanna talk about here, or at least I think I do. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Here we go. Come on, it's not that one. Oh boy. Okay, now I'm gonna have to fiddle. It's not that. 
It's not that. I think it's this one. Yes. A little tricky here. Ooh. This clicker is a little hard to hit right on the right thing. I think I got it. Okay. I hope. So that was the video that was sent from New York to Minsk. Um, I had no idea. Oh, let me get this to stop. No one has seen it a second time. So I was, if anything, concerned. Because, <laughs> like, what in the world are they going to do with this? How did this say, follow me? Yes? So I think this student created a real challenge for her partner. She did not send them a kind of gift. She sent them a problematic and slightly demonical, demoniacal, I think is the right way to say it, video. So we waited to see what came back, and this is what came back. Wait a minute here. I'm having a little trouble getting myself on. Okay, so here is part two from Minsk. Вот. Ну вот вы меня спрашиваете, говорите, что, что изменился этот мир. Но я считаю, что этот мир совершенно не изменился. 
изменились люди. А мир, он таким же, как был, так и остался. Никакой в этом трагедии нету. Какая в этом трагедия? Для мыслящего человека вообще, я вам скажу, ничего не произошло. Вот. Для пустых людей, ну, для художников, для людей творческих натур, для которых цвет имеет первостепенное значение, конечно, произошло. Известно, что ну, все люди говорили, что это произошло с утра, когда они проснулись. Некоторые думали, что, может быть, они просто плохо провели э, прошлый вечер. Но я даже не знаю. Я не знаю, что это такое. Нам не сказали. Мир и до сих пор цветной. Просто люди не могут видеть цвет. Возможно, она, вот мы как как-нибудь с нами такое произошло, и, возможно, мы вообще ничего не видим, мы не пользуемся зрением, мы ориентируемся другими органами чувств. Может, так и случилось, просто у нас у всех разом лопнули глаза. Я думаю, что просто закончились все фарбы. Ну, вот там всякие лицкая лакокраска. Я думаю, что просто, ну, стал конвейер, и все. Перестали выпускать такие баночки, такие, такие, такие. И алоукол не стало, и не стало акварели. Ну, и все. Ну, чем малевать? Черно-белое. Я привык к этому. В сознательном возрасте, а я его считаю, это где-то уже более сознательный 12-16 лет, у меня не было цвета. И, возможно, даже меня это не расстраивает. В целом, я считаю, что для будущего, для совершенного человека цвет не имеет совершенно никакого значения. Потому что будущий совершенный человек, он углублен в глубокие вопросы, которые волнуют, которые имеют значение для всего человечества. Мне кажется, что черно-белый мир гораздо красивее, чем цветной. Это как черно-белое кино. Что бы ты ни снял, будет красиво. Кино было убито двумя вещами. Сначала оно было убито звуком, потом оно было убито цветным изображением. Сейчас, мне кажется, мир пришел гораздо больше гармонии. Именно потому, что в нем исчезли цвета. Теперь им можно наслаждаться. Не верьте всему тому, что говорят про нас СМИ. Мы не сектанты и не террористы. Мы цветные войны. Люди, которые научились управлять своим воображением и теперь борются с этим черно-белым миром. С помощью искусства и силы воображения мы способны изменять этот мир. 15 лет назад люди утратили способность видеть цвет. Но эта проблема только в нашей голове. Мир остался такой же цветной. И если вдруг вы увидите вот этот знак, то знайте... Цветные войны где-то поблизости, и они помогут вам, если вы захотите увидеть. So, that was the response. Um, as you can imagine, my Sunni students were completely flabbergasted. Um, they were amazed that it was turned into this sort of quasi documentary, um, and that the background imagery in the first one, which involved obviously black and white turning to color, and then back to black and white as a representation of the boy's mood, was turned into this kind of whole text about life and society and politics. I don't think they understood most of it at first, but it triggered a lot and made them think, what, what are these people talking about? And why do they have such um, strong opinions and etc. Also, I'm not going to try to give an analysis of it. Um, it's just so interesting that it goes from basically a video of one person to a kind of portrait of a kind of society. Uh, and I think that's also, you know, there are many things one could talk about. But so this is an example of something that occurred in one of these courses that I happen to do. Um, and I just want to emphasize one aspect of it, which is this is what you would call student-generated content. In other words, although there were readings, 
and there were uh, more traditional academic aspects to the class, that the centerpiece were these video exchanges from which I, as the professor, had no idea what was going to emerge. So it meant that every week or every other week, we would spend part of the class, because we met face to face. This was not an online course. Neither of them were. Actually, that's sorry. In this case, the, the Belarusian course was primarily online. So it's a little unusual. But uh, so my students would produce these videos, and I would see what would happen. And I and they would all have to respond and discuss. And they were required to also write and correspond with their partners. And sometimes just writing, like what, what does a what does the young woman who made that first video say to her partner in Minsk after seeing her video? That's a challenge, you know? Um, and then what does she do for the third video, which she was obliged to make, and then the fourth video? I'm afraid I'll, I'll leave you in suspense about those last two videos. Um, they are actually quite interesting, but um, there were hundreds of these made. This was, to me, one of the more interesting ones, which is why I chose to show it to you. Um, so let me go on from here, though, and get back to some of the more central topic. But I thought this would be, um, oh boy. Ah, OK, so I think this is where we were. So that, oh, I meant to show this slide. For any of you who don't know where Belarus is, you can sort of see it barely on this map. It's a landlocked country. It was part of the former Soviet Union. Um, became independent when the Soviet Union collapsed and has been quite a, has its quite own interesting history. So there are many, I'm going to shift away from that. So there are many names from this work we're talking about. This is not all of them. I just thought I would pick these because they're the ones most commonly used. Virtual mobility, which was a term developed in Europe, still in use. Telecollaboration is primarily a reference to people who use a similar format for language and cultural learning. Not solely, but uh, so if you Google telecollaboration, you will get references to uh, related work to what we're discussing here. But probably 90% of it will be by teachers who, let's say, are teaching English in uh, Italy, working with a teacher teaching Italian in the US, or something like that. Uh, it's a bridge concept that grew out of that subgroup of professors, um, usually with a very heavy uh, layer, though, of cultural in inspection, too, not just language learning. Globally networked learning is another broad term. We actually used that at the COIL Center for the first few years. When we named the center, we never thought that it would become a generic term, but we started to get people writing us and asking us, uh, how do you COIL a course, you know, et cetera. And so the term kind of lifted off and became a term for a kind of practice, not really the term for the center, although it still has that name. So that's created a little ambiguity out in the field, I would say. Is does COIL mean a practice or a place? And um, I try to keep them separate because I think the term is so useful and is catching on. And I've been to conferences where somebody stands up and talks about their COIL initiative, never mentions SUNY, never has any reference to that piece. So I think it has kind of flown out as its own term. Virtual exchange, the last term I'll mention here, cyber pedagogy and others is a reference to the fact that professors invent this and give it a name. And I, I've heard many people come up with their own new names for this practice. So it's a little bit of a problem for an emerging format for it to have many different names. It certainly makes it harder to research it because uh, you don't know what to look for. But at any rate, I, I do want to mention virtual exchange before I go on because this is the term that a couple of larger funders have attached themselves to. The State Department in the US co-funded along with um, some others, an initiative called the Stevens Initiative. Um, and they call what they do virtual exchange. And in Europe, there was just a big funding through Erasmus um, for what's called the European Virtual Exchange Project, where universities were allowed to apply for funds. So this is another, I think, virtual exchange and COIL are probably the two terms most often used. So COIL is a method for repurposing online education so that it serves a new goal that of providing meaningful international experiences for students. So many of your students 
will ha likely have careers in which they must work with other nationalities or with clients or partners in other countries, often at a distance or as part of virtual teams. But very few institutions teach the skills needed to be successful in this emerging workplace. And I first thought of this piece when I was actually in Japan a couple of years ago, the only time I had been there talking about the same thing. I was thinking, well, what is it, how does this particularly relevant to an island culture, which Japan certainly is? Um, it's interesting that since that time, Japan has sort of taken coil to heart. Um, and actually, the M Ministry of Education of Japan this spring is going to be launching their own COIL initiative. They're actually going to be funding, I don't know the process yet, uh, Japanese universities to do COIL initiatives specifically with North America. So this is a possible opportunity coming up. Um, But I would say, you know, I, I think of the U.S. as an island country in a way, um, and certainly Newfoundland is an island. So I think when you're separate, when you're more separate than others are, I mean, if you're in Belgium, you know, France and the Netherlands are, you know, an hour away. Uh, but in many other places, you're more isolated, more separate. There are many advantages to that, but there are also disadvantages. And one of the things is that I think it's more likely, in fact, that students will ultimately be involved in projects where they do work at a distance and where they're part of virtual teams. At least if they're staying put here in the province, that opportunity is likely to become a real career option. So these courses are at least partially training for being in that situation. To simply say, oh, well, they're all on Facebook anyway, that's pretty irrelevant. When you think of the behavior that takes place in Facebook and you compare it to actually doing serious work in a, on a project with people who you don't know at all, um, it's very, very different. So I would not say our digital citizens, our students who are used to Facebook, which probably includes most of us in this room too, are necessarily at all trained and prepared for this world we're talking about. So uh, to talk a few more specifics. Um, in most classes, students can respond to the content provided to them in online courses, but their local knowledge is usually not sought out, nor can they easily discuss their cultural perspective regarding the topics at hand, because very few courses see intercultural exchange as a goal or a learning objective. Therefore, most courses, even those that are online, do not serve to deeply connect the world any more than does television. Instead, they broadcast the concepts of the course producer or teacher to others, irrespective of who and where their students are. I think we need to do more to build true online bridges to other cultures, and I believe we can accomplish that through COIL linkages. Now, I should say, off of the big caveat, that what I'm saying so generically is not true for everybody and for every class and for every teacher. Some people are very aware of this, and it's very much part of their teaching. But some students aren't even interested in it being part of the classroom. So there is a whole arena here of discourse um, about interculturality and position. So while many large universities collaborate internationally on research, few have significant experience with intensive collaborative networking in pedagogy. So engaging in a deep intercultural reexamination of why and how each class does what it does can be a potentially radical and revealing intervention for students, for instructors, and staff. So COIL is an exciting but challenging format. So for instance, you, let's say a teacher here who's teaching environmental science 101 or whatever it would be called, partners with a teacher in another country teaching environmental science 101. The chances are when they actually get together, they will find that their curriculum are entirely different. In fact, they might not share a single common element other than the topic. In other words, disciplines are not internationally consistent. They're driven by local politics, by local realities, by availability of literature and the, the common language. There are many, many things that are much more local than one would suspect. So when one is developing a COIL collaboration with a partner in another country, one really has to take the time to see, well, how do they look at the discipline? How do they look at the class topic? What is their syllabus like? It may be very different than mine. 
So this requires some effort, but it's a great learning experience. I think, you know, one of the things that's happened through doing COIL courses that wasn't really on my mind so much at the outset coming out of media was the realization on the part of both professors and students that things are ha d done differently in other countries and that what we do, whoever we are, is not necessarily the best way or the right way, it's simply our way. And I think that's a revelation in many cases. It's also, I should say, though, quite honestly, can be a challenge and a threat. If you decide you want to do a COIL course and you find somebody with whom you'd like to do this, and it turns out they have rather different opinions than you about the, the subject matter, then that's something you will have to negotiate. So this is part of, I think, any collaborative effort is finding you know, proper meeting grounds. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna show one other video. Um, this is actually, it's a little odd that I'm showing this. Um, so at SUNY, one of the issues that we realized, and you would have to think this through here if you wanted to pursue this kind of project is, well, who are my partners? Where do I find them? You know, like, well, what's, you can't just sort of, um, I don't know what, put a sign on Facebook and say looking for partner, although I'll explain in a bit that we've done that. Um, so you need some way to reach out. And one of the things that we did at SUNY is we created something we called our Global Partner Network. And it was really simply a way to um, bring others in and have a group of schools that were committed to this format so that their teachers would have some resources. So if they wanted to work with our teachers, it wouldn't all be on our shoulders to help them get it together. Yes, and so um, this developed in many different ways. I won't give you that history. Um, there are approximately 30 uh, universities around the world that are now part of the SUNY Global Partner Network. Now, there are some pluses and minuses to that format, but that's what we did. One of the first ones, well, one of the early ones was Kansai University in Osaka, Japan. This came out of that same presentation I referenced earlier. Um, somebody came up to me afterwards from Kansai and said, I really think this is a great idea. I'm gonna to try to develop it at my university. And a little while later, maybe a year later, she had gotten the buy-in of her college president, had a couple of professors who wanted to teach COIL courses, and launched what's turned out to be one of the most successful COIL initiatives. They now have an entire COIL program, um, and when the Ministry of Education launches in the spring, the expectation is that they will build that initiative at Kansai University. That is, they will become the sort of um, administrator of that program, in fact. Um, that developed over a few years. But when my colleague Keiko decided that she wanted to push this and really invest in it, her first challenge was, well, how do I get the campus involved? Because nobody knows about it except for about six of us. So she decided to produce a video that would be used primarily internally as a way to just tell people what it is. So she produced this four minute video. She got my input and our input at SUNY. Um, but it's really her video. And then she also produced an English language version of it, which is what I'm going to show you now. It's only four minutes long, and it's, I think, a good summary of kind of what COIL is. Oops, I pressed the wrong button. Uh, in practice, let's just see if I can do this one. Okay, so here we go. COIL. Collaborative Online International Learning is an innovative teacher model which enhances the globalization of campuses and students at higher education institutions. With a strong track record in providing and supporting over 100 core courses involving over 30 countries, the SUNY Call Center at the State University of New York is recognized as an international leader in the field. Kansai University is the first institution in Japan to formally join Cole's Global Partner Network to enable ongoing collaboration with the SUNY Cole Center. So, what is COIL? Also known as Global Network Learning, COIL is an innovative teaching and learning model that provides faculty and students the ability to collaborate with their peers internationally through the use of online communication and collaboration tools, such as Facebook and Skype usually incorporated into regularly taught on-campus courses which are partnered with another university in a different country, the COIL model gives students a unique opportunity to discuss topics and issues with peers across borders and time zones, engaging in a larger international audience. 
Let's now look at some actual examples of KU COIL, COIL courses at Kansai University. Kansai University formally joined the COIL Global Partner Network in 2014. We now have access to COIL's networks, including 22 SUNY campuses, as well as with universities in Germany, Scotland, England, the Netherlands, Australia, Mexico and Turkey. In the spring semester of 2014, three KU Core courses were introduced. These were cross-cultural competence in collaboration with SUNY Oswego, study skills with SUNY Ulster, and international business with Glasgow Caledonian University in Scotland. In the cross-cultural competence course, students at Kansai University and SUNY Oswego first met virtually and introduced themselves to each other on Facebook posting short videos on the group pool and commenting on each other's videos. The students were then divided into 10 subgroups, consisting of Kansai students and SUNY Oswego students. Group members then began working together via Skype and other online collaboration tools to discuss topics of global importance such as food consumption and energy and power. This global project ended with the production of a tangible outcome, a final report which students completed collaboratively. Through these interactions and activities, students on both sides were able to feel and understand their different viewpoints emerging from their different cultures and backgrounds. Perhaps more importantly, especially for the students, they made good friends abroad whom they can keep in touch with through the same online communication and collaboration tools and they may be able to meet face to face in the future. This whole experience will increase their motivation, lead to more in-depth learning and help them become more willing to see things from different perspectives, even in their daily life. Through this approach, COIL connects multiple courses across borders and time zones, utilising online communication and collaboration tools, thereby providing students with authentic opportunities to interact and learn from their peers around the world, improving the intercultural awareness. The experience that students will have by engaging in the COIL experience will become a strong foundation for working effectively, collaboratively and successfully in the increasingly globalised business and academic fields. COIL. Collaborative... Too many buttons. Okay, Whew. got back there, let's get that. So, um, I've mentioned this obvious, it's obvious, it's an, co collaborative online learning is inherently networked. You can't do it on your own campus. You have to have international partners. In that sense, it's a somewhat radical regime. Most things that universities undertake can actually be done locally if they determine and have the resources they wanna do it. This one requires others. So I'm, I'm, I think we've got through some of what is COIL already. I'm just gonna say a few more words about it, um, talk to you for maybe 10 more minutes, and then I'm gonna open the field to questions. So it's important to know it's not a specific technology or a platform. People have said to me, John, you, you know, why don't you create COIL software, and then you could sell it. Uh, that's not an interest on my part. It's never been what we're doing. And one of the reasons is that different universities in different parts of the world have different technologies that they're comfortable with. So ultimately, COIL can be applied to what you have here and to what your partners have there. And that's really about where you do COIL. It could be done on Blackboard, it could be done on Facebook, it could be done on Google Docs, it could be even done through email, et cetera. There are a lot of ways you could approach it. That's not what I'm here to talk about. So, um, and it is always based on team taught learning environments. There are no COIL courses which are taught by one professor. It's always bilateral because the two teachers themselves are there to sort of represent their cultures and to there be touchstones so that when issues develop, questions arise, both of them together or individually can be responsive and can help clarify things. Just simply bringing two groups of people together who are different 
or have different backgrounds does not guarantee that you're going to have intercultural understanding. It requires some thought as to how they will engage each other, what they will discuss, how it will be framed, or in fact it's possible to have the opposite kind of outcome. The courses are sometimes fully online, but actually historically about 90% of all COIL classes have been face-to-face -face classrooms where the, online, where the COIL work is an online overlay. So two traditional classrooms who are doing their COIL work online. But there are others, of course, that have functioned as fully online. So it's not a single template, one size fits all. It has to be adapted to the local framework um, and cross-national partnership. For example, some classes make intensive use of video conferencing, while others have little real-time interaction or use simpler synchronous technologies like text chat. So just imagine two examples. One, you're collaborating with a university in Florida who's one and a half hour difference in time, or you're collaborating with a university in Japan that's 11 hours difference in time. Just that time zone issue would affect your course design. It doesn't mean you couldn't do a synchronous class with Japan, but it would be very different and you probably have to have your students come to class in the evening so that the Japanese students would be there the next morning just because of the time zone issue. So you can't kind of just say it's all like this. Um, it's also a question of technological and bandwidth availability. <laughs> there are m many places where having the kind of bandwidth to have dependable class-to-class -class video conferencing is simply not viable. There are too it's too likely to have breakdowns that would limit the class. On the other hand, most places people can at least occasionally get access to personal tools such as Skype, so you can have the students communicate outside of class synchronously in many cases, even if your own classroom uses more traditional um, asynchronous tools like discussion boards. So there's a lot of ways to develop this depending on your specific partner. Language skills is another key issue. This is one of the main things I'm only going to touch on it. I mean, are your partners, I mean, this is primarily an English-speaking area. Um, of course, Eastern Canada, there's a lot of French also, um, but not so much here. Um, your partners could be primarily English-speaking fluent, but they may not be. So how do you manage that? Um, there are a lot of ways to approach it, um, but obviously there has to be some level of common language or you're going to have a tough time. Um, that's a whole discussion itself. I mentioned time zones, but there are other time issues besides time zones. In the workshop this afternoon, we'll talk about a few of them for those of you who come, but I'll just give you one other time example, academic calendars. So at SUNY, where I, I was most long based, the academic year almost always began the beginning of September. But in many countries, academic year begins in October. In Japan, it begins on April 1st. So what do you do? It's all different. So you have to you know, design things to work. I would further say that in some countries, smartphones are much more accessible to students than our computers. So we've done projects where the primary work was actually done on the phone, not on the computer, because students didn't have adequate access to a computer to do enough work. That's a somewhat extreme case, but I think there's a lot of work migrating towards tablets and phones. Um, but I think one of the most important things to mention is that because of some of these issues, COIL collaborations are likely to last from five to seven weeks, not the entire semester. This is very important. I think most people come into this discussion assuming when you talk about COIL, you're talking about the entire semester. That's quite difficult to do. I won't go into all the reasons now. But, so most often, people find a chunk of time and a chunk of content I'd say five weeks being the most likely, where the two courses will overlap, where the two groups of students will work together. That leaves them another eight or nine or 10 weeks where the two groups are working just as usual, completely separately, and can cover the normal course material. It's very hard to 
combine everything because you probably have learning objectives in your classes that you must attain. And if you were going to coil the entire course, it might be very difficult for both teachers in two cultures to attain all their learning objectives simultaneously. So usually the design process is to pick those areas which will be most mutually beneficial, overlap them, and keep some of the others as separate endeavors. Um, a response also is, well, couldn't we just do this briefly, a week or two? And indeed, there are some uh, collaborations that are much shorter duration. We started to call this pre-coil uh, because it really takes students at least a couple of weeks to get to know each other enough that they're really going to be willing to collaborate and do anything of any significance. It just takes time like everything in the world. So if you try to do your COIL in two class meetings, it's fine to present a lecture and have students ask questions, but that's about it. If you try to say, well, we just met, th met this week, by next week you're all to complete group projects, it's just not going to happen and you're gonna probably get pushback and people will be uncomfortable. You need to develop trust and spend some time to have that kind of work take place. That's what's led to this particular. Um, so cooperating teachers work closely with all students, but in most cases, the students are enrolled, charged tuition, if there is tuition, and awarded grades only at their home institution. So this is also a somewhat radical model. In effect, the two classes enhance each other but they're not integrated with each other the way, let's say, a dual degree program might establish. So um, in the end, they're really like two parallel worlds, but the students are doing collaborative work. At the same time, that collaborative work must be required. If you try to do a COIL course and you say this is an option, this is an elective, this is extracurricular, what will happen is a lot of the students won't do it. Their partners then will be really pissed off and we'll say, these damn Canadians, they're all lazy. They're not doing the work. We're doing the work. And then you create, in fact, worse racial and other stereotypes. You, you enhance intercultural insensitivity. So you really must make it clear to every participant that this is part of the program. Nevertheless, because of, I would say, both natural and legal reasons, um, you really need to grade locally. Excuse me. So, so, for instance, if one of your students here was in a COIL course with Japan and they felt that the Japanese teacher was actually grading them, that might upset them. They might say, that teacher doesn't understand me enough to grade me. So it gets a little tricky, but it still means that Japanese teacher should at least weigh in and tell the Canadian teacher what they thought of the work of their students because that's where the teachers will get some intercultural learning. So you may think that your students are performing this way, but your partner abroad may see it really differently. And if you never learn that, then you have missed out. And the, the sort of stereotypical example which I've encountered is you have uh, a group of students who are used to being very uh, intensive participants and contributors in class, teacher, teacher, I want to say something, or I disagree with you, teacher, I think you're full of it and I have a different opinion. That position in some cultures is simply never exercised. That students are primarily listeners, note takers, and respondents. And when you put those two groups of together, two groups together, it's not easy and it requires a little time for the students to sort of see how each other behaves in the classroom. And it's very possible for, in that particular dichotomy, for the, I'll say, American student to be extremely outspoken, for their teacher to think they're an excellent participant, but for their peer teacher abroad to think they're a loudmouth, obnoxious person who's interfering with the class. So that's the kind of thing you need to share with your partner. Now, I know this may seem a little scary, it's not maybe the main kind of thing you normally think when you go to teach a course, but I think there's a lot of learning here. And I think when students realize that behaving in the classroom is really different in different cultures, they learn from that as much as they do by reading their books and writing their reports. That's what these courses are partly about, is on a deep level understanding that other people act differently and it's not right or wrong, it's just different. And that's, I think, central to these courses and to their potential success. 
So um, wanna, I'm not going to go to this. This is not interesting. I'm going to show one other thing that I think is very important. If I can get it. Okay. So um, actually, no. Let me. Yeah. I'm going to show you two things here, and then we're going to wrap up. So first of all, earlier I gave the sort of example, which is an intuitive one, of environmental science 101 partnering with environmental science 101. That's very rare. The reason is you have to find a partner. And your partner is not probably going to teach the same course as you. The question is, how different a course might they teach that you would still want to partner with them? This is not intuitively obvious. Most professors coming into this assume that they're going to try to find a teacher who's extremely close to them in subject and discipline. But what we found over time is that often the best COIL courses are interdisciplinary and sometimes radically interdisciplinary, meaning on the surface there's no connection. So what I'm going to show you now is a few examples. Um, this is from a project that the COIL Center did in Mexico just about a year ago. And just to give you some background, the question is how do you partner people? I mentioned this earlier. So we created a kind of dating website-like place. Didn't look very much like a high-end dating website, I have to admit, pretty crude. But it was basically a place where professors could post their interest. Hi, I'm a media professor. I teach these two courses at this university. I'm interested in finding a partner in one of these fields. I'm available spring semester 2018, and I teach between this month and this month. I'm fluent in English. I speak a little Spanish and French. Please contact me. Sort of like a dating profile, but for a very different reason. Um, and we use these sites, and I'm not going into all the details, as a way to move this agenda forward. But what would happen is you'd have somebody say, I'm a media arts teacher, and there'd be somebody visiting the site looking for the environmental science professor but not finding them and saying, oh, maybe I could do my course with a media teacher. And they would write and say, hi, Mary, media teacher. I'm doing environmental science, but I'm actually interested in how media presents environment st environmental issues. Maybe we could collaborate over that. And they would start writing to each other or, or Skyping or talking, and they would develop a course or a module, I should say, really, because that's what these are. So I'm going to give you some examples. Here they are. I'm not going to, I'll go through a few of these. There's a whole bunch. So the first two are the courses. The third is the module. So this is, these are, some of these are very extreme, but I'm trying to make my point. So the Mexican University workshop case analysis of management in the food industry. The SUNY partner who wrote to them teaches Asian American art and design. I mean, I can't think of two things much further apart. Uh, and they came up with a module called The Diaspora of Asians in Gastronomy and Visual Arts. So obviously, that professor in Mexico had to be rather flexible. I'm sure that he or she never thought that they would be working on a course such as this. Um, but these things developed, and the advantage is, to be honest with you, one of the lurking issues with any collaboration is people's ego. So if you have two professors of law who are each going to collaborate from different cultures, they may at some times bristle at their opponents, their opponents, I'm saying, I'm exaggerating it now, their opponents, their, their partners' uh, position, thoughts, ideas, and say, wait a minute, I don't believe that, that's wrong. Um, whereas if you're working with somebody in a slightly different field or discipline, it's much easier to feel complementary because you don't see yourself as an expert in their field. So this is a real advantage to stretching. The other advantage is it's way easier to find partners if you're not looking for somebody who's a clone of yourself. So I'm going to give a few more examples here. Some are further apart, some are closer. There's another pair that's extremely far apart. And that was the module that they devised. So an engineering course and a history course, coming up with a course that's probably more closer to the latter. Common markets, common ground, how globalization and trade bring nations together.
This one I don't completely understand, but that's okay. Um, but you can see this, these are closer together on the surface, but I'm not exactly sure what the joint course really is. But those are the, the what, so we ask people, we do training workshops. We're gonna do a short workshop this afternoon. I wouldn't really call it a training workshop. Um, we often do these extensive workshops for two or three solid days long. And th at these workshops, both professors are present for the entire two or three days. So what they're really trying to do is hash out together, face to face, in a cohort with support of facilitators, what it is they're going to do together. And that's the context where these things have evolved. But unfortunately, in some of the examples I'm giving you, I don't really know the final output. I, all I know is what they walked out of the workshop saying they were going to do. So this one is much closer together. Again, not literally the same, but these are two people at least working in approximately similar areas. The other issue can be that when you look down the disciplines or programs at your university and you look at the similar list at your partner's university abroad, they may simply not offer the same programs you offer. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that's a dead end. I'm putting a lot of energy into this one thing because I think it's one of the keys to being successful at doing COIL, is working interdisciplinary, disciplinarily. So here we have another stretch. And one of the interesting things, you've seen this before, this is English as a second language. Language classes are particularly good because the main thing you want in most language classes is to get the students communicating in the target language. It's not that important whether they're talking about food cultures or football. The main thing is that they're talking and they're communicating and they're getting past their fears of expressing themselves directly, possibly to native speakers. And so you can do a lot in that context. I'll just mention one other course. I'm not going to show any more slides of this, um, which is um, uh, there's a law professor also from Mexico. We've done a lot of work in Mexico. That's why so many of my references are there. Uh, who's a law, a law professor posted saying, I'm interested in finding a partner, and I teach in the human rights area. Uh, so what happened was a social work professor from the University of Buffalo who had been teaching teachers of social work, but the problem that she had encountered, and she was aware of this going into it, she wasn't seeking this as a result, was that when her students were talking to her about disability issues that they would encounter, um, they said, well, what are our legal recourses when we have these problems? Our student, my, in my practice, I have a person who can't get to work because they don't have proper access. What do they do? And this teacher, who's a social work professor, said, well, you go to a lawyer. And they were like, okay, that's great. That's not really helping me. So she wrote to the lawyer in Mexico and said, would you be interested in partnering with me where you would advise us on the legal approaches to responding to these issues, and I would advise you and your students on how the social worker engages their clients and would, in fact, encourage them to speak to you, because this is a basically a network necessity. We need a few people to succeed. So he agreed, and they developed this large module on disabilities across these two cultures, which are handled very differently, Mexico and the US, and the legal ramifications. And the course, this COIL was so successful that the Mexican law school decided to incorporate that course into their standard curriculum, and they built it out and offer it to all students who are going through that curriculum now. So that actually, in fact, generated a new element. Um, I want to show you one other thing, which is very different. So this is a slightly ironic slide that um, I made like eight years ago. It's been, been, I use it all the time. Maybe it's getting a little tired for me, but um, very different tonality than anything I've said today. So this is a sketch of how we, what we want to do in terms of getting our students out into the world. Um, there are some motivations on the left of why we might want to. Um, we're trying to build this bridge uh, so that the students can get to the world. And we build it on three pylons, faculty or professors, technology, 
and international programs. Those are usually the three components at the university to making this viable. Um, however, after I did this for a few years, I realized that I'd left something out, which was administrative support. Hello. Um, I think that's a sign. Um, but I asked her to do that. So um, let me just finish this slide off. So uh, because so much of the work that I had done in the early days, and as I said, many other professors had done, was faculty driven, was professor driven, was not administratively driven at all. And that left a lot of the very excited professors not feeling they were adequately supported um, to do this work. Um, so gradually we shifted and been looking much more to having real administrative support, which I suspect you would have here, although it's very early days, so I can't really predict. Um, but in the water, I just don't want to forget about those creatures, are some monsters that tend to interfere with this process, possibly devouring faculty or students in the way. So the first one is technophobia, and I think that's less the case these days, but is still there. Bureaucracy will never go away. It's always a problem. It varies from school to school how significant it is. Um, faculty staff overload, if I had to redraw this graphic, I would make that crab about three times as large. I think that is the biggest problem, the biggest blockage to this really expanding. Most professors are working very hard, and they know that doing this kind of work, at least at the outset, is going to add to their workload. It's simply new. It's additional. It's something you have to think about. You have to rethink at least one course to make this work. And for some professors who are very excited about this conceptually, that could be a roadblock. So I, I admit that, and I don't have an easy solution. Some schools manage to support faculty through release time and stipends, but honestly, most of the schools I've worked with in and outside of SUNY are not able to do that. So this is a lurking question that I'm sure would be on some of your minds. And the final one is cost. And I would say cost is really, in the most part, only an issue these days in terms of the same topic, human resources. It requires people time to do this. Professors, and to some extent, support staff to make this really fly. Um, the technology is pretty much in hand. I doubt that Memorial would have to purchase a single tool or piece of software to be successful on an initiative like this. It's not about that, it's about people. So I think I'm going to end here. I have a few more slides, but I think I've talked long enough, and I'd like to have some time for you folks to ask questions or raise issues. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. John, uh, we have we have uh, time for questions. Uh, Courtney has a microphone, uh, so as to capture it on the webcast, we'd ask you to use the microphone. If you're uh, watching virtually, uh, then coil the hashtag coilnl will get your question uh, to John in a timely fashion. So, over questions, please. Who's going to start? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just have a quick question, uh, really interesting, um, and I'm just noticing the camera right, right in my face as well, so there you go. Um, I know it's not necessarily the point of COIL, but I wonder if there has been data on, say, students who participate in a COIL class, if there's maybe an increased propensity to study abroad afterward, like physically study abroad, does it open kind of a gateway to that experience? Yes, the answer is yes, at, but I, I don't think we've done enough ga data gathering to give you something truly quantitatively solid, um, but from a lot of anecdotal evidence and one or two very small studies, it seems to do exactly that. Um, one of the limitations, of course, is students' ability to actually do that. So I'd say for, I don't know, two-thirds maybe of students, they even if they want to go, they're not going. Um, but for that other group, who are basically never really took it seriously. They never thought, why, why would I want to do that? It's just scary, and what am I going to get out of it? Um, for some of them, it's really open doors.
Uh, thank you, John, for your presentation this morning. As, as new programs are developed on college campuses uh, and working through, uh, is this something that they're considering for new programs, building in at the program level? Uh, do, do you find more of that? Going, 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 uh, going on? Yeah, you're referring to COIL being built in at the program level, yes. I'd say just now, it's all pretty recent. As I said, so much of this work was individual professors saying, I want to do this and launching it on their own and then struggling a little bit to keep it going and justify it. Some of them becoming uh, kind of campus champions. Um, but now I think there is a shift and people are really looking. if. if if in their mission statement the university has internationalization, and they then look around and see what are they really accomplishing, they see small numbers and they realize they're not accomplishing that goal, and if they're serious about it, this is a partial solution to that, in which case, yeah, support comes. But it's still a little bit early days. I think one of the, it's an ironic piece, so much of the real, I think, energy and motivation for study abroad and exchange came from people like myself, actually, who had these amazing experiences and became very motivated leaders to make this happen for other students. For those people, and I can remember early conversations, you say, well, we're going to do this through computer-mediated exchange, and they like, oh my, are you crazy? I mean, you have to be on the ground, you have to smell things, you have to touch things, you have to be afraid even to really have this experience. So, and I don't think that comes from a wrong-minded perspective, but I think it's taken time for people to accept that this version of international exchange is powerful and interesting. It's not better than the other, but it is an alternative. What we hope it doesn't become, and this I'll just raise this, no one's brought this up, is a kind of second-rate version of internationalization that's available for the people who can't afford the other. I mean, people have brought that up in a kind of, what should we say, confrontational way, like, why, you know, that's what this is. Um, I don't think that's the case. I think a lot of international exchange, its value depends on how it's structured and how the principles organize it. You can spend, you know, three months in another country and come back having made very little contact with the reality of that country. It just depends how you live there, what you do, what you engage, where you provided any insights and structures while you were there that would really engage you and make you understand things differently. A long answer to a short question, sorry. Other comments? It's particularly from people who might imagine themselves doing that here. I mean, that's, I'm, I'm here as much as anything um, to help and hope that I might be motivating a few people. Yes. In terms of like student feedback from people who have really taken part in COIL from all over, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly, what have you heard? Yeah, we, we'll have a SUNY, actually, a project that I started, but I left. We'll <clears throat> soon be publishing an assessment of one project that's just covered with uh, student comments and, and evaluations of those comments. They're almost always phenomenally positive. But it's funny, because entering the door, they're not always. They're sometimes, oh no, what did we get stuck with taking this class? Um, they're sometimes fearful of it. And there's a couple of reasons. One is it's the unknown. Um, and a number of the classes that we have structured have been done with universities in the Middle East and with Mexico. And these are both countries that have presently a political charge. Um, and the expectations of students was very negative. They felt, in fact, I. I'll just tell you an anecdote, because um, it was in my class years ago. We did a collaboration with two universities. This is my video course. One was in Turkey and one was in Mexico. And I met with my SUNY students, and the first day, one of the students said, as a joke, um, how can we do video collaboration with them? They use wooden cameras, don't they? Being a smart ass, sort of. And I said, you know, that's not very funny and not very true. Um, but it was, that was, you could tell, that was the underlying fear in a way. How can we do even this class? I happen to know these two schools that we were working with. So I said, for next week, let's all post pictures of our video editing labs. I said, I said this separate from that comment. So we did. 
And then the next week, the same student immediately, as soon as we got there, said, they posted fake pictures from the internet. And I said, what are you talking about, Stephen? And he said, they're labs that they put up there. They're much better than ours. And I said, and? And he said, that's not possible, right? We have better equipment than them, right? And I said, no, they have much better equipment than we do. Why do you think that? And he was like dumbfounded. He couldn't imagine that. So students, like professors, everybody has a fear of dealing with the other. And that can scare students away from being part of it. They have to cross that bridge and see that there's a lot going on in the rest of the world. It's not all us. Um, so this raises a question of strategy, which is do you t how much do you tell students before they take your course? Mm -hmm. And there's a big argument about this. So one group says, always announce it very clearly so that students only take the course that they want to so that they are not walking in the door with potentially negative vibes. The problem with that is that will filter out a lot of students who will learn a lot if they do it. So it's an interesting pedagogical question. But yeah, the, the responses are almost always positive. Occasionally, I'd say the area where there's the most negative is when technological challenges become too great, which can happen. Um, and secondly, and this is a design problem, it's very hard for professors to cut back on their carefully designed course content and provide space in the class for the students to just meet, say hello, what do you do at night, blah, blah, because they feel somehow that's not serious. And when we do training workshops, we emphasize that you've got to give them that. You have to actually provide it in the new syllabus that there's space for you to have an icebreaker or to have activities so they can hang out a little bit. Not a lot, but a little bit. When teachers don't do that and they just plow right into the work, the very first day, it's work, 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 the students stay kind of at a distance and it's just like a task and they don't engage each other socially, they don't develop trust, and when you ask them to do collaborative projects, they don't know what to do. They're frightened to share a project with a student that they really haven't met. So those are the two issues, I would say. We have a question from Twitter from Patrick Arsenault. He says, you talked about different fields collaborating. What about different levels considering varying uh, education systems? That's a great question, and one I worried, wor wondered about when we got this going. Um, we have a lot of examples of very mixed levels working together, but in each case, it really comes down to the two professors at these two levels really sharing what their students are able to do, what they'll be comfortable to do, and making a call. Uh, the first one we did was years ago, and it was between a grad student, a, a graduate level class, and an undergraduate level class. And what happened was, in this case, was that the, when the undergraduates walked in the door and effectively said, you're going to be partnering with grad students in your field who are two or three years older than you, at least, and have a lot more experience, they panicked slightly and then really got down to work. And that professor said they did the best work they've ever done because they were challenged. And, and there's also a little bit of face saving involved. It's one thing if you don't do as well as the person sitting next to you, but when it's this international guest who you're supposed to work with, you kind of have to wave the flag a little bit and show up. So that's the case. One other area which is be quite different in Canada, in the US, many, many college students go to community colleges. Almost half of all colleges in the US, college students are attending two-year colleges. Um, in general, because of the status issues with universities, it's very hard for community colleges to partner abroad with, they're just very hard for them to do it because most research universities, let's say in Europe, don't want to partner with a community college. It's like the status difference is too great. But for some reason in the COIL context, people just, it's not quite as, I don't know what it is, it, they're willing. They're willing to say, well, we're not actually sending our graduate students to SUNY Community College. They're just going to work together for six weeks. So, okay, we'll do it. And so we've seen a lot of multi-level collaborations that I don't think could have taken place in a traditional or face-to-face -face contact. Somebody would have just put their foot down and said, 
No. So I think it's, it's another advantage. Maybe if in two or three more years, coil is taken very, very seriously, then that sort of snobbishness will start to have, hold more sway and people will say no. I, I don't really know how the future will go on this. Is there a, a question back there? Oh, good. Thank you. Um, I'm wearing my administrator's hat way too much these days. That's okay. That's good. And one of the problems I see with this early, early on is attracting students to the, you know, we, we create a brand new course that's combined with a, a course at another university somewhere else. We attract, we've got to attract students into that. We've got to go through all of the processes around that. As an alternative, I can see a model where, let's say we've got a consumer behavior course here and a psychology course somewhere else. And the courses remain reasonably unchanged at both ends, but there's a collaborative project in the middle of it. Mm. Do you have any experience with that kind well, of well a model? No, that's very close to what I'm presenting. Oh, okay. Um, the question is, what do you mean by the middle? I think the only issue, and this is something that we've, is if you think the middle is just going to be a week or two, it's problematic because the students, as I was just saying a moment ago, if they're really going to work together, they need time to, that, so it takes time. But I would say, oh, at this point, 95% of all virtual exchange COIL courses I know of only last four to seven weeks of the semester. They're not actually COIL courses. I should use this term that we came up with, but I never use it. It's called COIL Enhanced Module. So it's a chunk of time somewhere towards the middle of the course, but that varies. And the rest of the course is left almost identical to where it was before. Maybe a few pieces are moved earlier or later in the course so that they're covered and don't have to be covered during the collaboration if they don't seem mutually appropriate to both teachers. So I don't think you're disagreeing very much at all. Sorry if I was unclear about that. We have one more. We have one more question through Twitter uh, from Natalie Spracklin. How much work is required for program development? Study abroad is about one year to delivery. Thanks. Enjoyed it. Natalie. Wow. That's a very good and difficult question. <laughs> um, I, I, the model that we built at SUNY, which is pretty intensive and took a while to get to, actually was about seven months. In other words, from the time a professor raises their hand saying, I think I'd like to do this, to them being in the classroom doing the course was about seven months. Um, and that had to do with going through two levels of professional development. The first one being very lightweight introduction to what COIL is. It's kind of like what we're doing here times three. Not very much and spread over a month and taught completely online. Just a, a kind of like, these are the different pieces of the puzzle. These are the things you might want to learn, uh, think about in partnering. Just an intro. Then that ends, and then they have to find a partner. And once they do, participating in an intensive course development workshop of some sort. Again, I won't discuss in detail. And that to go through that whole process had to happen soon enough that you could put it into the schedule and get agreement from your chair or dean, so that also pushed it back a little. So typically, if you wanted to teach a course, let's say in fall 2018, a COIL course, um, you probably want to raise your hand in January of 2018 to say, I'm interested. Then you go through some kind of professional development process partnering in the spring so that by the end of the spring semester, you'd be good to go for your fall course. So that's talking about it from the teaching and professional development side. If the question is more about um, administratively, that's a harder question to answer. It really depends on how the school wants to engage this. Do they want to do one or two pilot courses? You know, there are other models where you're doing, I didn't get in my presentation, I ran out of time, to doing large cohorts. One of the things that we found was ultimately, but I wouldn't start there, a better model. 
was to say, put together 15 partnered teachers with their partners, 30 individuals, bring them all together in a room a bit bigger than this, and spend three days with all of them together, not just in pairs, but with all of them. And what happened is they were able to help each other and then started to form a sort of social community of practice that allowed them to sustain some of their discussion beyond any training. And this was also a way to reach thousands of students fairly quickly through these 30 partnered teachers. But I don't think you start there. That's something that's a couple years off um, if you want to go down that road so you can start to produce that much engagement. But I don't think you start there. I think like doing two pilot courses, two or three pilot courses would be a good starting target. And I, I just say I advise against doing one pilot course. And the reason only is that sometimes, although if it's discussed publicly enough, it may not be a problem. But I had this problem, and I've realized it's common. When I did my course at my university, what happened at first was nobody followed me. In fact, people said, oh, did you hear about John Rubin's strange course? Isn't it amazing? And people would talk about it, but it was like I owned it. I didn't want to own it, but that's how it felt on the campus. So nobody else wanted to do a course like this because it was like it was mine. And so what I've realized since as I've talked to people at schools is if you have at least two people doing this at once, it feels much more accessible to other professors and not so much somebody's unintentional property. So two or three, I think, is ideal as a way to get something like this off the ground, I think. That's all of our virtual questions, unless anybody else has any further no, questions. We, we have run, actually, two minutes over our yes, uh, time. Yes, thank you very much, John. Um, for anyone who's, who's again, who's uh, peaked, uh, their interest has been peaked by this, and, and you're, particularly if you're attending virtually, we do have a video conference with Grenfell for this afternoon, and we're back here in an hour for a workshop for this afternoon. So uh, please join me in thanking John for a very interesting presentation.